Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, good afternoon, because it's 12 Two or so, or wow. there. we're two minutes late today. Two minutes late. We're so sorry, but yeah, we we are a very small but powerful group today. <laughs> yes, we're, we may have more people join us, but it's we're it's start, summertime, and you know I've yeah. been out, and so we lose the kind of regularity lose the of meeting and people. You know, it's heck. I have trouble remembering what I'm supposed to be doing. So anyway, we're glad all of you all are here today. We are. Um, we are going to you know the whole series here is the books of Ezra and Nehemiah together because on the Hebrew scrolls, they are one book. They're one story about the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the temple, the walls. But in Christian Bibles, they're split into two, two books, Ezra and Nehemiah. And today we are at Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. Yes, we are. And we'll meet Nehemiah the cupbearer. Yes. So, yeah. So, so what's last, new? I was just going to tell everybody that <laughs> last night at 1130, when we finished doing our prayers... I was reciting the books of the Bible. <laughs> Scott was giving me a Bible lesson, <laughs> truly, about the I whole can't do that. Ezra and Nehemiah and how they're just one book, you know, in the Hebrew scripture, but they're two in ours. And that's how we end up with this difference. I believe they've got 26 books. Where so I think it's 24. 24. And we've got 39. In the Old Testament. Right. Yeah. And it's just because, so, like, the, you take all those little minor prop the, the the shorter prophets, right. we should call them, like Obadiah and and I wouldn't Micah. want to be called minor. I <laughs> yeah, wouldn't want no, to be called not, the one or with lesser. The short book. Sometimes they're called minor. <laughs> sometimes they're called lesser. But, but they're really just, just bad. They're really just shorter. And there's twelve books like that. And for the Hebrews, they're um, all on one scroll. So we break them out into twelve all separate books, books, and that's the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. Plus the splitting up of Ezra and Nehemiah, the splitting up of Kings, the splitting up of Chronicles, and the splitting up of Samuel. That's kind of the whole story right there that in is. a nutshell. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> no class today. <laughs> no class. We're on. If you can get it. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So Nehemiah today, the cupbearer. It's good. And we were back. The all wedding went well. It was warm. It was lovely. Beautiful. And we're... And Glad we should be, be back. back on Tuesdays for a while. Yes. You know, as I've said, the, the Tuesday class is going to move back into Peril Hall at some point. I'm what, what I'm waiting for is for the technology to be in Peril Hall that will enable us to live stream it to Facebook, just like we're doing now, because there are a lot of people who can't. That now we picked up people who live in other places, and there's other people who just because of their health and stuff can't make it um, to can't drive up to the church. So I've promised for a long time that when we move back into the building, we're going to move back in and do the online at the same time, the live streaming. So that's what I'm waiting on. As soon as that's ready, we'll be back in Piro at noon on Tuesdays. Joe Osley's so sweet. She said she missed us. Well, yeah, we missed we, you too, Joe. I saw Joe yesterday. I did too. Yeah. I did see her. I didn't yeah. get a chance to say hi to her. I did. With my new role now, where I have to got to sit up in the front, I don't get as much, you know, walking around and. I talking. saw her. I saw her in church. You know, like before the nine thirty service. Oh well, I was running in <laughs> at nine twenty nine and thirty four seconds. Yeah. So <laughs> sorry. Yeah. That's, anyway, that's your way, isn't it? It is. Darling? It is. I don't expect anything else. I know. So I know. anyway, know. it's a good thing he keeps his, you know, his expectations <laughs> low. And then when I get I there at nine twenty five, he's amazed. <laughs> I, just, I just know not to look for you at nine twenty five. And you missed a, you missed a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. I know. At the, the nine thirty service and... before the. Before before church yet before the service started because the imperial brass were playing fourth of july stuff yes. and a march and other things and got to hear little, a little dixieland bit of and and we were dancing in the aisles practically oh, it was so no, i don't believe okay that. i was okay. dancing in the aisles <laughs> <laughs> but anyway all right i think you better open i think i better up. Okay, gracious Lord, we are grateful to be gathered here again on this Tuesday. We missed not being together last week, um, and we just pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us as we move into the story of Nehemiah, this cupbearer to the king who who gave up all of his personal prerogatives and so forth to, uh, to come to Jerusalem and to rebuild what was his ancestral home, really. And just help us to hear the story well. Help us to see your work through Nehemiah as you work in our own lives. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All righty. All righty. Moving over. 
Okay, we'll get reconfigured here. Okay, so, uh, let's see. Get myself all set up, turn the Bible on, put the glasses on, wow. Okay, so, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah basically tell one story. The story they tell is the story of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And, and to appreciate that, you have to appreciate that Jerusalem was the great ancestral home of the Jews, had been for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It was the place where the temple of God was placed. Solomon's temple had stood for um, 400 years, let's say. 400, I'm calculating. 400 years or so. Um, and, and so it's, it's symbolic. It's where um, most of the population lived. Um, in the waning years of the tribe of Judah, of the Israelite kingdom called Judah, it was all centered around Jerusalem. And um, in Jerusalem, there was the temple and there were the walls. And those two, two things are really what, what constituted this to be this, this, this great city of, of the Jews. So Ezra, the book, tells the story of Cyrus allowing Ezra to return and a project, and Zeru, is really beginning with Zerubbabel and then Ezra, and this project of rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. But rebuilding the temple is not enough. It's also essential that the walls be rebuilt because in the ancient world, um, the walls, walls were what protected you from your enemies, from those who would do you harm. Um, there was really no easy way for people to overcome city walls. So typically a conqueror like Nebuchadnezzar would lay siege to the city until eventually the city just had to just had to surrender and give in because they were starving and, and hungry and there that happens in in the biblical stories from time to time in, in, in Jerusalem. So uh, the book of Nehemiah tells the story of the rebuilding of those walls and uh, Ezra the priest brought back the law. The Rubabel led the original rebuilding of the temple and Nehemiah is going to lead the effort to rebuild the walls. And so this, the, the reconstitution of the city of Jerusalem. So that's what's happening. The book of Nehemiah is structured very similarly to Ezra in terms of return, some opposition, some rebuilding. You're going to meet Ezra again because Ezra and Nehemiah are contemporaries in this story. I brought the timeline back we'll look at in a bit, but they are... They are contemporaries, um, and uh, so it's really about putting the people of God uh, back together in the home uh, that God had given them. And uh, anyway, we'll have more to say about all that. So let's start at chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. So let's just take that brief phrase and put all of this into some sort of time and place context. Because I think it's just so important that when you come to the Bible that you understand, that people understand that these are... Ours is not a religion primarily of ideas. I like ideas. But it's not. It's a religion of what, of what God did, of what happened in very specific times, in very specific places, to very specific people. It is first and foremost a history of what God has done and the story of what God is doing, the true story of, of what God is doing and indeed will do. So um, let me go over to my slides. So this is the king of Persia at the time we're describing because um, 
Nehemiah says it's the 20th year without saying anything else. And the way that works is that it's in the 20th year of his king. And his king is Artaxerxes I, who you can see had a long reign on the throne of the Persian Empire from 465 to 424. Okay. So in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, it's 445 BC. So boom, we can peg that right there. The world, the ancient world of the ancient Near East was the world of kings, and um, everything time was measured in terms of their reign. You even see that in the New Testament, right? When they we're talking about a census and stuff in Luke, it's all referenced to the years that Augustus has been on the throne. So here it is the same thing. Um, the month of Kislev, which is basically December, the big holiday in Kislev is Hanukkah. It's the ninth month in the Jewish calendar. Um, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, 445 BC, while I was in the citadel of Susa, that would be the capital city. And so here is a map of the Persian Empire. You can see how extensive it is, right? The different colors are when these chunks came into the Persian Empire. For example, if you look at the white arrow, that is pointing to Judea and Galilee, Palestine, Canaan, depending on what name you want to use, that was brought in along with all of the rest of that light green area by Cyrus in 539. And that's when he began to allow um, uh, the exiles in, in Babylon to return. So Nehemiah, though, is not in Babylon per se. He is in Susa, the capital city of the Persian Empire, and that is the White Star. So you can see that's actually a long way. You would have to basically, to get to Jerusalem, you would head northwestward and go up, and then when you reached uh, you know, Damascus or something, you would turn southwestward to get to Palestine. Cause Cutting across the Arabian Desert is not somebody, not something that most people would do. So that's a big empire that the Persians that the Persians built. It would be later conquered by Alexander the Great, but that, my friends, is a different story. For so, another day. For another day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so in December. In 445 BC, I'll translate it here, while I was in the capital city of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. So, you know, um, Nehemiah's got family and he's got cousins and he's got brothers and, and this is a brother of his, a family member of his who has been in Judah how that came to be, we're not told. But um, Hanani has come, and part two, part B of verse two, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. So, uh, I love the fact that in the NIV they use the word remnant because of what has come to be known as remnant theology, that even as God's people suffered, even as um, uh, it would seem like it must be the end for them, God ensured that there would always be a remnant to carry on, right? And so seeing the, the returning exiles and the survivors from Jerusalem as a, as, as a remnant of the Jewish people, a remnant to build upon, is a really good way to see it and the word when you run across it and the translators use it it's a, it should be a reminder to you that god makes promises and god keeps promises and the really cool part is that a way to understand jesus is that he is a faithful remnant of one i've, I've talked about that before but I, I like coming back to it jesus is a faithful remnant of one Right, God had formed a people who proved to be unfaithful to God, who would not love God and love others as they should. And it would seem that all the great promises of God 
must go crashing into ruin because the people had entered into a covenant with God, a treaty with God. But God provided one faithful Jew named Yeshua from Nazareth who would love God and love others every day and in every way and who would be faithful to God in all things, even, even unto death. So, um, Nehemiah wants to find out about the, the survivors, the people, and he wants to find out what state the city is in. Because cities, cities can be symbolic, right? I mean, gosh, when the World Trade Center went down, it was this incredible, awful, terrible loss of life, and it was also this great symbol that came crashing down in a city that symbolized America in so many ways and had for so long. So, you know, we can't, we should never under, underestimate the importance of symbols in our lives. That we use sim, symbols play an important part of telling our stories and, and they can have a lot of impact on, on us. Um, so, so Nehemiah is going to find out all about the survivors, find out all about the city in verse 3. And notice all this is written in the first person, right? From these long lists of everybody's yes. names we had in Ezra 10 and stuff. Now we get something very personal. Also, one of the best parts of Scripture is when it gets very personal and almost poignant at times. So Nehemiah is writing this. It is, it, it is what? It is like his memoir. Think about it. We would use that word today. His memoir, verse 3. They said to me, Well, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. So they are in great trouble because they have no protection because of the walls. They're, you can bet they're economically not in any great shape, right? The city was a burned out hulk when they returned to it. What kind of resources did they really have to 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 get it um, to get it put right and disgrace? That's a, such a funny thing, a disgrace, because I don't think that's a word that we would think we would encounter right here. They're in trouble, they're hungry, um, they don't have any protection, but disgrace, and they are in disgrace because they don't have a wall. They're not a proper city, and these cultures. In the ancient Near East, they are honor and shame cultures. They are not the world we live in in America. Yes, yes, we like to be honored and nobody likes to be shamed and the rest of it. But in, in an honor and shame culture, everything is driven toward the gathering of honor. Everything is driven toward the avoidance of shame. You've heard the phrase honor killings. When a, when, when a father in a family will murder his own daughter because, because she has shamed the family and he wants, wanted to erase the stain of that shame. And for you and me, that's incomprehensible. It's incomprehensible. But it illustrates the power of honor, of gathering honor and avoiding shame in such a culture. And so these people feel shamed. They feel disgraced. And yeah, they're living in this burned out hulk of what was once this great city. And you can be sure there are theological dimensions to it that aren't mentioned here specifically, but they're there. You know, they, they had disobeyed their God. They had been unfaithful to their God. And look where it had brought them. So, yeah. So Nehemiah heard all of this, and of course, it's a it's much more than than just expressed in these in the two sentences of verse three. So after he after he hears the story and the condition of things, he says, "When I heard these things, I sat down and wept." This is their ancestral home. This is this is the city of David, captured by David, the the place of Solomon's temple. God's city, the city of God, 
all of that wrapped up in this, along with the people who have suffered so much. So what does he do? What would you and I do? You know, in my sermon two days ago, I talked about how, you know, certainly St. Andrew is a very, um, a lot of type A folks, very achievement-oriented people at St. Andrew, and a lot of very successful people. And so we would, you know, my inclination would be to instantly start putting together a plan, coming up with an idea, and so forth, and I have to stop myself. And I would have to stop myself and to come to God and to pray. Um, for Nehemiah, here's what it says. For some days I mourned and I fasted, and I prayed before the God of heaven. He got it right. Before formulating all his plans and coming up with his ideas and organization, gathering resources and whatever he else he thinks he wants to do, he sits down, he gives voice to his grief over what has happened, um, and he prayed and even fasted, which, which is a way of... Uh, a personal way of uh, prayer. And he fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then he's going to pray. And the whole rest of chapter 1, except for one little bit at the end, is Nehemiah's prayer. So when you hear people talk about Nehemiah's prayer, this is the one that they mean. You may not hear about it that often, but... Um, so... Any uh, thing over there, Patty, before we no. go on? No, no we're cool. Yet. Yeah, we're good. Good opening. Good opening. It's a, I didn't write it, huh? So, but see, Nehemiah pulls you in, right? He pulls you into he the does. story. He does. Because it's a personal story. Very personal story. He says, Yahweh. So he gives voice to God's name. Yahweh. That's what those small caps Lord is. Underneath it in the Hebrew of the scroll, it is Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, the Tetragrammaton. Yahweh, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love. Ah, that's fantastic, isn't it? You know, people, a lot of people knock the Old Testament and they refuse to see in it the God who actually is. They look at all the wrong places. What is this covenant that God made with his people at Mount Sinai a, a thousand years before? Before Nehemiah. It, Mount Sinai and Moses, that's a thousand years before Nehemiah. It's a covenant of love. The two great commandments. Looking forward hundreds of years from Nehemiah. What does Jesus say the two great commandments are? which are part of the covenant. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love your neighbor as yourself. You see, why do we exist? Why does the world exist? Why do humans exist? Because God is love. Because God desires to have those whom he can love and, and who will love God in return. So it is a covenant of love. And so Nehemiah recognizes that this God, this great and awesome God, the creator of the cosmos, of all things, of creation, who separated the light and the dark and the water and the earth, says, who keeps his covenant of love. God is not just a big maker of promises. God is a keeper of promises. He keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Scott, I'm just going to say something a minute. Um, I am aware that um, on Facebook, on like the iPhone app, Scott is coming in great, but he is frozen on what is on my laptop. So I'm just And that just seems know. to happen sometimes. It just it? does. I've tried closing it down and reopening it, but for right now you're frozen there. So if you all can hear us, just hang in there. I'm sure yeah. it's going to come back. It's just one of those things, but it is working on the on the iPhone app. And I'm sure I'm sure that's on the iPad. Yes. It I'm seems to work better if you're using Apple's iOS. 
Yes, you're working right? fine then on, on the, the iPad desktop also. system. I don't yes. know why that is, but that but that's true. So but just want to let anyone know if they were out there and watching that um, I'm aware. But unfortunately, since you're working on both the iPhone and iPad, uh, iPad most apps, people are. They're just one yes. or the other. But if you have an iPad, get on it. It'll work better. Okay. So, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Right? So, let's just pause there. This, the covenant that God had made with these people, well, with the ancestors and of these people, and thus with these people who inherited this covenant, was, is, it, it's, a, it's two sides to this covenant. Right? God loves them. And the covenant is that God has blessed them and is going to bless them, but they have a part of the covenant to keep themselves. They are, to, they are to live according to God's teachings. They are to love God. They are to love others. That's the essence of the law, the essence of the covenant that they willingly enter into at Mount Sinai. And these people are the inheritors of that covenant. And they know it. And so you can say, but, but, but Scott, these, they don't ever keep the darn thing. You see? And you, you would be right. You would be right. They're not that different from you and me. And thus, the problem of the people's unwillingness to keep the covenant is a problem that is solved how by God? By God taking on human flesh himself and providing a faithful Jew, right, who will keep the commandments, who will love God and keep his commandments every day and in every way. That's, that's the real key to unlocking this story and understanding how the, how the Old Testament, how the New Testament fit together. So he says, great God, verse six, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. It's so this is, it begins as an intercessory prayer, which is a prayer made on the behalf of others. But you will, and you may say, well, but hey, come on. He's an Israelite too. Well, he knows that, and he's about to pull himself into this. He's not excluding this. He's not saying, well, about those people. He's just calling God's attention to these people, to God's people, to the people of Israel. And he says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. And Nehemiah, as you will discover, is a wise man, and he understands that he and his family, that he and the Israelites have not lived up to the simple commandments that God has given them. And I, I think it's... Um, we're going to pause. I'm going to send Patty to the front door. Patty, go catch the front door. Catch the guy. The empties are all in the garage. That, my friends, is a moment when we look outside the window and see that I think the water guy is here bringing bottles of water that I failed to... What? Okay, very good. I was just worried because... <laughs> Okay, that'll be fun to listen to on the podcast. That's a moment of <laughs> real life inserted into the podcast that will last for generations here. Okay, so back to where we were. Um, he knows, he doesn't have to enumerate, he doesn't have to list all the sins. He knows that he has not loved God and loved others in, in as he should, that they haven't kept the covenant. The re, remember, for the Israelites... They, they understand that they have suffered the consequences of the choices that they have made. When they, when they chose not to walk in God's ways, when they chase after other gods and goddesses, they suffered the consequences of that. Just the outworkings of all that. It wasn't that God had to really smite them all. They just suffered the consequences of all of that. 
um, sometimes at church at St. Andrew when we do um, we, we go through periods where we do prayers of confession I will admit that I will sometimes hear people mm, they'll grouse about that just a little bit as if they don't have something to confess and wow 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 that's that's just so wrong if we had nothing to confess we sure wouldn't need Jesus right but we all do we, we, we all have if you think about it in the truest sense we all fail to do the things we should in loving God and loving others and we and, and we do things that we that do not reflect the love of God and others it's really it's really just that simple and it, it might be big things yeah but also might be lots of little things that we do so you know that's always when I come to something like this I want to make the pitch that we can't ever exclude ourselves from this need for confession and indeed and indeed my friends Nehemiah does not exclude himself nor does he exclude his, his family right my family verse 7 we have acted very wickedly toward you we have not obey and you might say wickedly I thought he was a pretty good guy. Well, I don't know. Okay, I guess he's maybe a pretty good guy, but but to fail to love God and to love others, to to sin in ways large and small, is what creates so much wreckage in this world. Because it's so much harder to actually do than to just say the words. The words sound so simple. Yet we can't do it. That's the thing. It's yeah. it's and it's and it's just it is sad. And so it should make us every day grateful for for Jesus and for his for the incarnation of Jesus, for his um, life, for his death, all the way to his faithful life, all the way to death, even death on the cross. It should drive us to our knees because we should recognize quickly and easily um, the evils wrought by sin in this world that we are all part of. And if we think we're not a part of it, we are fooling ourselves. In Scripture, there is not one place you would go to to find a any of any Bible writer talking about well, this certain group is sort of excluded from that. You know, they're that they're, they're okay. They're they're not really sinning against God. No, it's from beginning to end, beginning to end. And so we fall on our knees in gratefulness for Jesus. So, verse seven: We have acted very wit wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Now you and I are not bound the way in the the way that they were to the law. Paul makes that clear. The law served its purpose. The law is past. But the basic ethical structure of the law is still ours. Because Jesus said what? What are the two great commandments he's asked? What well, what's the greatest commandment he's asked? Well, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. Both come from the Old Testament law the Torah, the first from Deuteronomy, the second from Leviticus. We are, for Paul, we are to grow in Christ-likeness. That's the way for him to express the ethic of the Christian life. For the Israelites, that ethic, the ethic is expressed in, in, in the law. In some ways, in some ways, it's, it's tougher when it's not all exactly spelled out. It's a good thing we have the Holy Spirit within us, helping to teach us and helping us to, to understand where what we have gotten wrong because we might think it's easy to love others, but it's not. Particularly when Jesus says, ah, anybody can love their friends and family. You you know, you guys, you gotta love your enemies. You gotta love the tax collectors. You, you, you know, yeah. Yeah, you got to love everybody. Not easy. So, 
Nehemiah pulls himself, he, he begins this long prayer. He has not asked God, anything of God yet except God, except God listen. Let yours be attentive and your eyes open. Please, God, listen to me. Hear me. And then he, the first thing he does is offer up a prayer of confession. He hasn't asked for anything yet. He hasn't asked for anything yet. Verse 8. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, quote, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. That's the consequence. If you don't live in God's ways, if you want to embrace everybody else's way, guess what's going to happen? You're going to end up scattered among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name, and that place is Jerusalem. That place is, is well, just leave it there, Jerusalem, the temple. Okay, so what is God saying? Okay, so if you chase after, here's, here's this is the essence of what happens at Mount Sinai um, a thousand years before Nehemiah. It's this treaty, right? And God says, you know, if you're faithful to me, no matter how scattered you might end up, no matter what happens, I'm going to bring you home, baby. You're going to find your way back. But if you are, if you go insist, if you insist upon going your own way, if you think you know better, if you're going to worship these foreign gods and goddesses, Baal, Asherah, Ashtaroth, Zeus, whatever, whatever age and place you're in, well, all right, all right, then then you're just going to live with that. That's why, for example, in the book of Daniel, the, the whole thrust of the book of Daniel is this, that Daniel and his buddies, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, are in Babylon, and they are constantly confronted with the command to worship other gods. And the whole thrust of the story is their unwillingness to do that. Even a thousand miles from home, with no prospect of returning, they will stay true to Yahweh. As best they can, they will stay true to Yahweh. And so God says here, no matter where they are, at the farthest horizon, right? Because remember, and just think about how far that is. Because none of these people think they live on a sphere. You and I now know we live on a sphere. We've even seen it from space. Mm -hmm. Right, Patty? Unless, yeah. Yeah. unless the movie Capricorn 1 uh -huh. was correct and the whole thing was fake. Right, so we've seen, <laughs> we've seen we we actually watched that movie recently. I don't know. We had a little downtime and 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 it was it was kind of fun. So for for all of the ancient people in the ancient Near East at this time, for long before Nehemiah and to long after Nehemiah, their conception was they lived on a they lived on a flat. The world consisted of, of a flat sphere, not flat sphere. Oh my gosh, a flat disk flat disk. And so the furthest horizon is as far as you could see, as far as you could go to the ends of the earth. There's a phrase we still use. And it's silly. If you live on a sphere, there, there aren't any. There's no ends of the earth, right? But in the ancient world, the world in the book of Genesis, for example, you could go to the ends of the earth. Because it's just a flat disk, and if you went far enough, you know, you would get there. Now, the fact that they couldn't really do that, that doesn't mean that wasn't how they understood the world that they lived in. So God says, yep, yep, if you're faithful, I'm going to bring you all back together. No matter how far away you get, no matter how scattered you get, I'll bring you to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. And, 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 um... Nehemiah is, is really reminding God of, of what God had promised. And you sure, of course, God doesn't really need reminding, but he's giving voice to it. He's, Nehemiah is giving voice to that. 
He's giving voice to it for his benefit. Um, I think it's something we do in conversation kind of a lot, actually, with people that we care about. We give voice to things that somebody might already know, but it's important to give voice and get it out there. It's, it's part of having a real relationship, and that is certainly what God and his people are to have. Okay. So, Patty, anything so far? No, no, we are doing good. Just going to do a shout out to Brenda and to Don Kirchy. They are listening from the road. So, you guys be careful. I wonder where they are. Where are they right now? I, I am guessing maybe they were at church yesterday, so maybe on the way back to Florida. I don't know. Maybe they'll let us know. Okay. But be safe. Be safe. Hopefully, when we drove back from Florida after the wedding last week, we drove through monsoonal rains. I mean, it was ridiculous. And those 18 wheelers go careening by you, making it nothing but worse. Yep. But I won't get into a rant. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 10. So he's talking about the Israelites now. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. The man being the king, because you'll find out in chapter 2. Okay, so, verse 10, They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. To me, it's a little reminiscent of when Moses talks to God and really has to persuade God to... um, to stay with the Israelites. Because if you know the story, if you've seen the movie, you know that Moses comes down from the mountaintop with the tablets. What does he find? Well, he finds that down at the bottom they've made this stupid golden calf and are worshiping it and giving it credit for bringing them out of Egypt and all this crazy stuff. And God says, I I just can't go on with these people. If I go on with them, they're going to do stuff like this and they're going to get consumed by me. They're an unholy people. And they're just, and, and but I'll I'll just send my angel with you, God says. But Moses says, No, you have to go, and then he starts to list reasons. And one of the reasons is, but you brought them out of Egypt. You redeemed them. You redeemed them by your great strength and mighty hand. When in your Old Testament And I would submit even most of the time in your New Testament, when you come across the word redeemed, you should always hear in that the echo of the Exodus with Moses, the the freedom from bondage to Pharaoh. That's always, that's really always in view about what God did do for these people long ago. That's a, it's like the foundation of it because the Exodus, God, Moses fleeing Pharaoh to freedom, cross the Red Sea to freedom, that is the great salvation event in the Old Testament. Everything is shaped by it. The great salvation in the New Testament is Jesus, and so a way to understand um the Last Supper, when Jesus takes the cup and the bread, said, this is my body that has broken, my blood that is shed. And he is the, the lamb of the Passover offering. That is like a new exodus in Jesus. But, but in the Old Testament, the great salvation event is, is the exodus from Egypt. And uh, what Nehemiah knows and what we all have to remember is that the covenant, the law of Moses at Mount Sinai is entered into 
by God and the people after he has saved them. Right? So he saves them from Egypt and then they enter into this covenant, this treaty, as it were, at the foot of Mount Sinai. And you can read Exodus 19 and 20 and a little bit more and you'll see that, yep, 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 yep. Like three times, Moses says, are you ready? And the people go, yeah, 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 we're ready. We're for this. And their hand, I, I can picture their hands in the air and they're clipping and shouting and yahooing. Well, maybe not yahooing, but so. And then at the second time, the third time, they reaffirm their commitment to this covenant that they're entering into called the Law of Moses. So, but that's all after they have been saved. So what does that tell you? That the proper way to understand the story, even when you get to the time of Jesus, is not really that the Israelites tried to keep the law in order to get saved. That's, that's our vocabulary about things. It's not theirs, and it's not really even right. They, they strive to keep the law out of gratitude for having been saved. For having been saved. If you can begin to think about it that way and read the New Testament that way and read Jesus that way, then you begin to grasp, read Paul that way, then I think it will help you hear them better and understand better the relationship of, of, of the law and, and grace. And salvation and why Jesus says I have come to abolish the law but to fulfill it right um, because he is he is salvation so all right anyway so Nehemiah has offered up this big prayer um, please dear Lord in verse 11 let your ear be attentive to the prayer um, of your servants who delight give your servant, that's himself, success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man, this man being Artaxerxes. And you're, if you didn't have the rest of verse 11, this little tag bit at the end, you would have been going, well, well what the heck? Because, I mean, how, how, what, how could you, how could anybody, how could any Jew hope to go and talk to Artaxerxes? the king of the vast Persian Empire. But now we find out how. Because Nehemiah writes, I was cupbearer to the king. So let's, let's talk about that. Um, I was cupbearer to the king. Okay, so kings eat and drink like everybody else. Who brings them their food? Cupbearers. When the king gets paranoid about it, who taste the food? Cupbearers. They end up being very close to the king because they're kind of always in the king's presence and they're always at hand. And we know um, that sometimes cupbearers would even keep the royal seal, the signet. It would be a ring that the king wore that would have his seal on it. And they would be the, the keeper of that for times when it needed to be kept off the king's finger for whatever reason. So they were very close. Now, the deal is they are just cupbearers. So they're not like the king's, you know, numero uno advisor. They can only speak to the king if the king speaks to them first. You see this playing out in Esther, which is also set in Persia. The story is, 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 um, comes to us from Persia. That's where Esther is. And she is, at one point, wants to talk to the king, her husband, but she can't you know, she's not supposed to initiate the conversation. She knows it. She needs to. She will, but she's scared to do it. So Nehemiah is not supposed to open a conversation with the king. He's only supposed to speak to the king if the king talks to him first. So Nehemiah, what kind of family does he come from? Obviously a Jewish family, probably a wealthy Jewish family. Um, they are probably a family who has been there a long time because remember what kind of time frame we're talking about. So the initial exile to Babylon is in 586, and there were people who went in exile to Babylon 20 years before. 
Daniel and his buddies went to Babylon before 600 BC as everything is slowly grinding forward and winding up and the king of Judah was trying to appease the Babylonian king. So, so, and so now it's 445. So you take less than, I like round numbers, take, take 15 at 100 to it. And you get back to roughly the time the exiles were happening. So they could, his family could have been in Babylon, in exile, later Persia, okay, for 150 years. So just think about that time frame for a moment. Sometimes when we read the Bible, it's easy to compress things like they do in movies. You ever notice in movies they cheat a lot <laughs> on time frame? That was the problem at the end of Capricorn 1. They cheated. I mean, it was ridiculous. Ridiculous. I can't believe people didn't fall over laughing in the aisles at the movie theater. They went 300 miles in about <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was like, what? How could that be? It couldn't be. But so, so it's easy for us, particularly in the Old Testament, to lose any sense of the time frame involved. And that makes it harder for us to read it well. The, the New Testament's different. The New Testament, the whole... All the writings of the New Testament are written within a span of 50 years. That's, that, that's less than I've lived from basically 50 A.D. to 100 A.D. They're all done. Jesus' public ministry, which is the story of the Gospels and the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ, Jesus' public ministry only lasts two and a half years, right? But the Old Testament, the time frames are long rarely measured in years, often decades and centuries. Um, so here it's been 150 years that his family could have lived there. And they've been, remember, well, I think we said when we opened Ezra that we talked about Jeremiah 29 where God sends word through Jeremiah to the people in exile that you're there, build your homes, work for the good of Babylon, right? You're there. And um, I think many of them do. Indeed, many of them don't return. Hence, this book of Esther, which is set inside the Persian community that does not, uh, the Jewish community in Persia that does not return to Jerusalem. So, so it would seem, because he's cupbearer to the king of Persia, that his family, which is, of course, Jewish, is also wealthy. And by some means... But somehow, they've, him, probably an ancestor of his, his father, his grandfather, maybe a great-grandfather, got the attention of the Persian king in some way, and they've gotten his, this, you know, descendant, maybe, Nehemiah, um, ends up being cupbearer to the, to the king, part of the royal court. Do we know really how this came to be? No, we don't. Wish we did. Paul, for example, in the New Testament, is a Roman citizen. We do know that. Do we know how he came to be a Roman citizen, which most people were not? No, we don't. Wish we did. We can make guesses. We can make informed guesses, but do we really know? No. So Nehemiah now has heard of what has happened to Jerusalem. He has wept over it, prayed over it, mourned for it come to God in prayer um, and really just asked God to give him success with the king because in his mind, I think he is going to approach the king and he can do it because he is the cupbearer. So, end of chapter one. Anything, Patty? No, nope, we're good, Scott. Okay. Here we go, Nehemiah, chapter, chapter two. two. <laughs> <laughs> we can have you walk. We can let you know boxing matches. There's this really, um, oftentimes a very cute girl walks around holding up the. Used to be in the old days, walking up some card showing what round it is. Yes. Walking. Yes. No, we're not going to get one of those. We're not going to get one. Of those. <laughs> 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 I just made a decision. We are not getting Not going there, huh? Okay. I'll drop that. 
Okay, now I'll just tell you right off, there's a little conflict between chapter 1 and chapter 2 because here's how chapter 2 begins. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, so we know about Artaxerxes, we know it's the 20th year of his reign, 445, but Nisan is the first month of the, of, of the Jewish calendar, which would make this before Kislev. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So scholars, you know, they talk about this, and they debate about it, and some say, well... Here, this he's now Nehemiah is using this pre-exile agricultural calendar from a long time back, in which a Nissan came and the count the calendar started in the fall, and Nissan came. Uh, hey, bah. well, couldn't this actually yeah. still be that if it was December before? They're they're not talking like just on time. They're talking about in the King Xerxes reign. No. So couldn't it possibly still be in his reign? We, we but the month of Nisan is the first month, That's and the right. month of Kislev is the ninth month, and he's about to go to the king, whereas he just prayed about it. He prayed about it in the ninth month, and now he's in the first month of the same year. And how many months do we have? In Thirteen. Thirteen? Okay, so yeah. could this not be four months later, but it's still during the time of the 20th year of that king's reign? Perhaps so. I don't that's know. I'm thinking. That's we a good. Know, we don't that's know a good explanation. Started so if his reign started. You Some know. people think a scribe just made a little boo boo along okay. the way. My point being, it doesn't really who matter. cares? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care much. <laughs> I'll tell you. In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. That's what cupbearers do, right? I had not been sad in his presence before. I guess if I was king, I would like to have upbeat cupbearers around me. So the king asked me, quote, Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? Ah, this can be nothing but a sadness of the heart. So... You know, here, I picture it this way. Nehemiah goes in. He has heard the news. He's wept about it. He's mourned. He's fasted. He's prayed in the midst of all of this. He's trying to serve the king, and he just can't hide it. He's not a poker player. He can't put a poker face on and appear to be chipper and cheery when he's not, and the king perceives it. And in this, Artaxerxes comes off well, right? Because it's a caring question. Why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And then Nehemiah writes, I was very much afraid. Because he's afraid. Well, you know, he's, a, he's just a cupbearer. He doesn't walk out to unload his problems, his worries on the king, and, and you know, much probably much less ask the king for something. But I said to the king, quote, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So he has learned that his ancestral home is is in ruins and it just shows. It, it's, it's showing on his face. And so the king, I would probably say perceptively, said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, Nehemiah writes, and I answered the king, quote, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild it. So that is a tall order. He is asking to be released from his service to the king, to be sent a thousand miles away, however far it is as a crow flies, and to rebuild this city that is part of the Persian Empire. So that's, you know, that's not, that, that isn't a, I mean, that's something the king would be sympathetic to. It is a city in the Persian Empire that's lying in ruins. 
Um, and Nehemiah wants to go back to take on the task of rebuilding it. So one thing we find out about Nehemiah is he is two things. He believes, he knows that God is with him in this. It's God's city, right? This is the city of David. It's the place where the temple is, where the temple has been rebuilt as best it can be. Um, and and he's, I think he's also a confident man. Those two are not exclusive of one another. God works with us in things. Um, God gives us gifts and God expects us to use them and God's and God works with us in our use of those gifts. God's Holy Spirit works with us in the use of those gifts. So it's not an either or kind of thing. But it's a it's a big task. He is suggesting that he's going to take on, that he is going to rebuild this this city. Because like under Solomon, this was one of the great cities of its day, right? Remember the story. You may not have ever read the story, but you've heard, everybody's heard of the Queen of Sheba. Am I right in saying that, Patty? Yes, you are. I don't know why that is. But everybody's heard of the Queen of Sheba. Well, in the Book of Kings, the Queen of Sheba makes a trip northward to go visit Solomon. And when she does so, she is really overwhelmed by his wealth, by extension then by the wealth of Israel, because um, under the rule of Solomon, Israel's wealth and power um, is at its zenith, at, at, its, at its height, okay? Um, so it, it, it was once a great city and has now been reduced to a temple after a fashion and an unwalled, what would you call it? An unwalled village. Can't even call it a city. Can't call it a city if it doesn't have walls. So, if it pleases the king, let him send me to the servant to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, interestingly, we're not sure exactly which queen that is because there are a few possibilities. One is his wife, Artaxerxes' wife, whose name was like Damplius. His mother the queen mother who held a lot of power and influence as you can imagine. Um, it's a, it, it could even be describing the first of his concubines because all these kings had harems because they wanted to produce lots of children. So they all had harems as an expression of their wealth and they had wives and they had concubines and it's all very confusing. But this is that this is a significant person. Let's just assume it's his, it's the queen, Damplius, his wife, first wife next to him. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, "Well, okay, Nehemiah, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back?" And Nehemiah writes, "Wow, it pleased the king to send me." So I set a time. I told him, I think it's going to take this. How how interesting it is that the king assumes he will be back and wants him back. How long will your journey take? When will you get back? So this isn't an open-ended, oh, sure, just go to Jerusalem and stay there and I'll, you know, wave goodbye to you. No, nope, no, nope, this is a project. He is being sent on a mission, a mission from the king to go to Jerusalem and to rebuild the walls. Now, we'll see later what happens with all of that. Um, but, but yeah. Okay. So I also said to him, if it pleases, this won't surprise you if you were here for Ezra, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, that's the province on the other, that, Jerusalem is in, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Aspha, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. So, it's kind of funny. 
once the dam breaks and Nehemiah is willing to ask, it's a pretty big ask. <laughs> He's saying, look, here's what I need. I need letters to get me there safely. And then, you know, I need, I, well, I want to take with me timber to build gates and timber to use protection. in the city wall yeah. and timber to use to build a place for me to live. So obviously he's not planning on returning anytime soon, right? But look what he says, Nehemiah. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. <laughs> as bold as they are, as they were, God granted, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. This is like the returning of Ezra, um, the returning of Zerubbabel to, to Jerusalem. Remember that Cyrus sends them back and then they want to go back with the letters and with help and all that stuff and they get it all. And here, the same thing. Nehemiah wants to go back. He's got work to do and he get and the king is very supportive, providing lots of resources. Lots of resources. If he didn't, though, people just may not believe this guy at all, saying, hey, here I am, the king sent me, said I could go. He kind of had to have backup with he him. He did. So the king is a wise man. Yes. Plus, it's a dangerous world. So if you're going to actually get from Susa that we saw on the map all the way to Jerusalem safely, you're going to need to have yeah, uh, protection. protection. Yeah. And that's what the cavalry and officers do. And so it's kind you know, you could... So the king, I guess we could see it as the king is being wise too in this. The king understands maybe better than um, Nehemiah all that's really involved in undertaking this, this project. And he provides it with him. But verse 10 begins to foreshadow the future for us just as it was in the book of Ezra with the rebuilding of the temple. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Because in their view, this is all a zero-sum game. And if, if the lot of the Israelites is going to improve, it's going to be at their cost, their expense. You know, it. I'll just close with this because we. I do need. We're going to end it here, before we get to the next bit when Nehemiah returns. In the ancient world, economics consisted of. Was viewed as a pie, that could be split up and shared, or so you could get a piece of pie from somebody else or you could take something from somebody else and thereby end up with a larger piece of the pie, but it's a fixed it's a fixed pie. And it was fixed because these are agricultural economies and thus wealth is land. And land is fixed, right? We have learned in the past few centuries starting with Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations in 1776, that no, that isn't really. You can create wealth. Wealth doesn't have to simply come to you because of the land that you have, which would make it like a pet pie. You can actually grow the pie. You know? Um, uh, Bill Gates started Microsoft. You know, it just into this huge company. He created a lot of wealth in that by providing people with things they didn't know they needed but were glad to have, right? Same thing with Apple and other techs and Walmart. Walmart, my gosh, yes. Walmart created a way of retailing. It created wealth. And that, that's Adam Smith. And that's, that's the secret of, the, of, of really the economies we live in now. But when you come to your Bible... It, it's not how people saw things. They saw things as, as, as a fixed pie. And so sure enough, these guys are worried. You know, if the Israelites build themselves up, it's going to have to be at our expense. 
So when we come back together next week, we are going to see that Nehemiah is going to arrive in Jerusalem and undertake to check things out. To check things out. Look that far. Put you back in the picture, eh, babe? <laughs> you know, check it's so out. funny. I just thought for a second what? when you were saying you can't, um, can't build land. Thought about it though. See, there are places like Dubai. Yeah. They actually have created land out of the ocean. M much of downtown Boston was is Isn't built on on land that was you know built. But I know that isn't mean. really the yeah, way of, course, of, of the course, world. It yes. wasn't the the ancient people didn't have all the same technologies we have and resources to fill in harbors and build yes. and build land and so forth. But then of course things change because Ephesus were right was once yes. a port city and now it's seven miles it's, from the yes, coast. It, it is. Right? So things change, but still the point holds. Yep. Yep. Point holds. And having been there a number of times, it is amazing when you're there because it's just all this flatness. Yeah, forever. it was all once upon the Mediterranean Sea. Yep. All righty. Okay. Good opening. Well very good. Yeah, good opening okay, today. So um, thank you guys for joining us. Um, as I said early today, it was a smaller group today, but a good group. Kind of picked up steam. Kind of picked up steam, yeah. it did. And, um, you know, we know that a lot of people are coming and going with the summer and, and everything, but we're still going to be here. We are. We are. We have no, so. we don't go anywhere for a while. No, nope, we don't. So anyway, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this Tuesday. We thank you, God, for the long weekend that most of us got to celebrate. And we pray, Lord, that you would watch over and take care of this group as we started today on a brand new book, a small book, but an important book, God, in the Bible. And we pray, Lord, that um, as Scott is helping us to learn this as we go on, that we will learn some new and definitely deeper and think different things of your word that maybe we've never even considered before. We pray, Lord, that you would hold this group close together as you have, Lord, for a very, very long time. And Lord, we also pray that we know that a group, even with 30 or 35 or 40 people in it, we know, Lord, that you are amongst us, and we know that many of us have joys and concerns on our hearts. And we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would lift those joys and concerns to you right now on our behalf. We love you, Lord. Thank you for being such a faithful God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Bye, and friends. So it's, and so Sunday, I mean, let me plug Sunday before plug the Plug Sunday. Yeah, we're going to start a new series. That's right. Indiana, Indiana Jones and the Lost Images of God. That's right. Right. And so Monday afternoon, we're going to be back because all, all the classes are back next week. So Monday afternoon we start a new a new book. We're gonna do start First Peter. That's right. Next Monday at three o'clock. Right. All kinds of new things All happening in the middle of, of summer. All kinds of new things happen. You got it. And if now you we'll... ever want to see Scott dressed like Indy, it's this Sunday. It's oh only no! Happen. Don't make that promise. It may not be the first Sunday. I may. You said is it gonna be the first? I Sunday? don't know. I is thought it? it was. I don't know. We'll have to find I don't out, know. won't we? Okay. okay. But I'm assuming he'll only <laughs> do it once. So that means don't miss any at yeah. all. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Bye. Take care. Adios, Bye -bye. everybody.